mobilization. It, uh, it is an organization that spans over, over 110 countries with 6,100 workers. And it's their passion to uh, make disciples, to proclaim the gospel, even in very difficult countries like Middle East, India, and so on. Uh, so let's welcome uh, George for his uh, New Year's message to our church. God bless you, brother. Great privilege to uh, be back again. Thank you for your prayers. I've been ministering in more than 1,000 churches here in the UK the last 50 years. But this is uh, probably the most special church uh, for my wife and I. I wish we didn't live, at least in my thinking, so far away. But it's really southeast London, a little place called West Wickham. And uh, this is a special church because we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary right here a couple of years ago. That certainly dates us. And uh, we launched the new ship uh, the day before September 11, 2001. Our ship, Lagos 2, was at Canary Wharf. It was as we sailed out of Canary Wharf on the 11th that those airplanes hit the Twin Towers not far from where I was saved by the grace of God as a teenager some 57 years ago. And now Lagos Hope, the new ship, which is in Hong Kong right now, uh, really needs special prayer. It was headed for Taiwan, and it's an old ship. Things sometimes go wrong, and some things went wrong in the engine room, and they had to go back to Hong Kong. So please apologize to your... Taiwanese friends, I don't think we're going to get to Taiwan. Some of you really should at least find out about this ship. I believe this ship gives the greatest character building training opportunity perhaps in the entire world today. It's been going for 40 years. Uh, about 25% of our graduates who have served on the ship are involved in leadership in the body of Christ around the world. Our main thing isn't OM, it's the body of Christ. People don't stay with OM except a small number. 160,000 have been trained or had some training on OM and are serving Christ, often with their uh, local church. And I, it's hard to get the word around as people are on information overload. And so many people, even when the new ship was right here in London and 28,000 came to the ship. Of course, that's a tiny percentage, but you may want to check it out on our website and find out about it and how you could serve. It's uh, very much like your church. It's very international, interracial. 400 people live on that ship from about 50 nations. I was just there again in Subic Bay in the Philippines, and there's not time to talk about it this morning, but thank you for your prayers, and thank you for this uh, partnership. I never felt led to ask churches in Britain where I ministered to support uh, my wife and I, even though we were, uh, the family was very involved in a church in Bromley for uh, many years. But uh, in an amazing way, God put it on your hearts to support my wife and I. So you're the only church in the whole of Britain uh, that supports my wife and I personally. As soon as I say that, the name of Kenny Gann comes to mind. How many remember Kenny? Uh, B. Lee, of course, is still with us and will be visiting soon. Kenny is with the Lord in God's providence. I happen to be in Asia, <laughs> God's providence, when Kenny uh, went to Jesus. He had just been preaching in, Man in Manila, actually passed out on the airplane coming into Singapore. I visited him in the hospital. And in a couple of days, he'd been battling this illness a long time. Uh, Jesus chose to take him. And I hope that we can put together, when B. Lee comes back, uh, some kind of memorial service for this amazing servant. I spoke at uh, the wake, and then I also spoke at the funeral. But more than that, I listened to what other people shared about this brother, who I worked with closely in London for 10 years, and he was in our ship ministry 20 uh, years before that. 
and that yet I feel until a funeral and those wakes, they had three nights of wakes, I feel I didn't really know him because he kept a lot of things quiet. Uh, just the anointing on him and some of the response and some of the meetings uh, that he took uh, all over the world. So I'd like to just pray a prayer of thanksgiving, a sort of mini memorial prayer for Kenny, uh, who's with Jesus, but we'll pray for his widow and daughter, Debbie, now married to Jacob. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the life of Kenny Gann. Many I know in this church would have been at the wake or the funeral in Singapore if they were able. And lead us and guide us in regard to some kind of memorial service. which We just want to give you the praise and give you the glory for what you did through this amazing servant who came from such a rough background, even imprisonment in Thailand, drugs, and who then became a mighty warrior for you. We ask your blessing upon B. Lee and uh, the challenges that she's facing and also upon Debbie and Jacob living in Australia. And we just celebrate the promotion, the graduation of this great servant. We know on a global scale, not on a Western scale, but on a global scale, he lived a long life. And we celebrate that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we just finished Christmas, and uh, I spent Christmas Eve with my grandchildren and slept there, of course, so that I could get up early enough when they opened their gifts. So that's a big thing. How many had at least one gift for Christmas? You had at least something. You weren't left out. Raise your hand. Looks like everybody had a gift. If you didn't get one, this is your opportunity because everyone this morning is going to get a gift. You're going to get this beautiful, lovely uh, plastic bag as a gift. We have to learn to start small and be thankful for small things. So I'm going to give you this plastic bag as a gift. But with it, I want to give you uh, a book. So everyone can pick up a plastic bag. We have a little OM team here. Mike and Cecilia are also involved in your church. You're part of that team with their children. And Mike Van Buren, our team leader, they're both based working together in Forest Hill. I hope you'll visit them. If you go there, you can have 20 free books. So I know Forest Hill, you probably think you need a visa, but you could go there. So we want to give you this plastic bag. And uh, there's two tables there, the one table, all the books on that table uh, are free. So just take one, and if after a while, after say 15 minutes, there are any books left, then you can take two or three. So real book lovers, just hang around, and uh, I hope you'll be blessed. It's more blessed to give than receive. So you have to be willing to receive so that we can give. On the other table, very important, right? On the other table, there are some books we don't have so many of, and they're available on a donation basis. And we hope you'll take a look. Uh, when Good Men Are Tempted, one of the most significant books for characters like me, all my life, battling with lust. And uh, I know this writer personally. I know that he's living. He's walking the walk. And one of the great books of all times on that subject of dealing with lust. A book on dealing with extremes that can come in and tear the body of Christ apart. The Many Faces of Deception, a powerful book. And uh, Discipleship by Peter Maiden, who's been the director of OM for 10 years. And I'm not really allowed to announce who the new director is, but uh, he's Chinese. And he probably will not be based in Carlisle, where the international office is right now. And that's all going to happen this year. It'll be confirmed in Thailand. So this is a big year for Operation Mobilization. Peter Maiden, the man who's been director for 10 years, a godly man, a great Bible expositor, chairman of the Keswick Convention, has written a book on discipleship. And I would say if you pick up only one book next to the one you get free, pick up that book. The writings of Tozer, just listening to him on tape. Yesterday I had Martin Lloyd-Jones, A.W. Tozer, Jim Engel, and Charles Stanley all, uh, you know, audio messages just yesterday. So, whew, I'm really 
<laughs> ready to go this morning. What a privilege to get so much teaching by books, but also by audio. And my newest book is also available. You can download it free. Uh, I don't know whether it's on the free table or the other table, but probably on the free table. And uh, you can also download it off my website, georgeverwer.com. Praise be to the living God. I don't know how many of you are actively involved with this church. You're not just coming here, checking the place out, worshiping, which is good. You're welcome. But it's my prayer, and God's put this on my heart, because I'm not a member here. You don't see me that often. But I just want to encourage you as you pray to seek the Lord's face about actually getting involved with this particular church. It concerns me that many uh, people seem to just hop from church to church, sort of like the cinema, checking out the latest film. And I never would want to be judgmental. They might be just struggling, maybe not even have assurance of their, of their salvation or, or having other complexities. But I believe there's a great need today for people to commit themselves after prayer, after getting to know people, to commit themselves to a specific church. Acts chapter 13 shows that the local church is the key to world evangelism. Groups like OM only exist because of dynamic local churches. And of course, evangelists. As I was converted to Jesus in a Billy Graham meeting in New York City, and so I'd ask you for this new year to pray about getting involved with this particular church, such a strategic location. London is a mission field almost as much as any country we are working in around the world. We now have one million Muslims. One million Muslims in London. We're sending out workers to Muslim countries where there's almost no freedom, where they hardly can share their faith, they just have to serve their physical needs and, and get occasional opportunities to share their faith, and then some of them get thrown out, and we need to do that. But how much more we should be reaching Muslims here. I also, New Year's Eve, was giving out DVDs south of the river, and uh, I ended up in that mob in which uh, I think some people got injured in front of Charing Cross at about 12.30 at night. Do you know there was a similar mob in Ivory Coast and many, many died. And things almost spun out of control completely with 10, 20,000 people in front of Charing Cross. We saw people fainting and uh, the police were not able to handle it. I was right in the middle of that. I stayed south of the river, but they closed uh, Waterloo East Station and said the only way to get your train is Charing Cross but something went wrong they closed Charing Cross off and it's a miracle this mob uh, didn't spin out of control as they had in the Ivory Coast and as we have had in this country especially in football stadiums with many people dying I don't think they expected so many to show up for the fireworks a new year well we got to make a new year's resolution right as soon as you say that, you get opposition, you get cynics. Well, I made a New Year's resolution on January 1st. I already broke it on January 7th, which is tomorrow. So I'm not going to bother with a New Year's resolution challenge. Oh, I like to. I want to talk about a New Year's revolution. A revolution that the Holy Spirit can bring in your life on this new year. I have this prayer, I have this dream that this year, 2013, especially for you younger ones, those of you under 50, it's all relative, isn't it? I just went to a funeral of dear brother Fred Flack. He was 100 and 103, 104, well, maybe 106. I often fellowship with people who are over 100. I come out feeling I've really got more miles. But when I'm with my grandchildren, I feel I'm probably going to heaven the next day. So it's all quite relative. But I want to challenge you to believe God for great things in 20, 
13. This may be our final year. The Lord Jesus may return in 2013. And I just believe in God's providence, I'm here, and it's quite complicated uh, for this to work out. <laughs> Your pastor Peter is so patient with me in <laughs> finding a date. I leave for Switzerland on uh, Wednesday. I leave for Canada a week later. I'm off and out of the country. We, by the way, applied for British citizenship, and my wife got accepted, and I got turned down. <laughs> they, they couldn't figure out where I was. And uh, it's quite funny, really. Now I'm a second-class citizen in my own house. I think of those words in the book of James. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers. C.S. Lewis said, we have the tendency to think but not to act. We have the tendency to feel but not to act. And if we keep thinking and feeling without acting, someday we will be unable to act. I called that when I spoke at that great Urbana student convention back way back in the late 60s. I developed this term, was criticized for it, spiritual schizophrenia, where we be become like two different people. And there's the person we are when we're with our church friends and maybe when it's Sunday and we're in a great worship meeting. And then there's the person we may be the next Friday night or the next Thursday night with other friends in other situations. And I believe with all my heart, one of the greatest challenges of the new year, and it's good to do it at the beginning of the year, is to search our hearts. Are we really walking the walk? Are we really walking in the footsteps of Jesus and allowing the Holy Spirit to direct us day by day, hour by hour? Hour. What a challenge we have from the Word of God. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, because above all else, as I was preparing this message, I felt that our focus had to be the Lord Himself. I have, those of you who know me, I have so many burdens. I'm very concerned about the whole abortion challenge. That's why we want to give you this book. I just watched that powerful film, October Baby. Everybody needs to see that film. It even got into the cinemas. Uh, that deals so beautifully with the challenge of abortion. I'm burdened about the global HIV AIDS situation, and I'm very involved in that. I'm known for being a very project-oriented person. That's why even when I stepped out of leadership, they let me keep a ministry called Special Projects, which you actually support and which Kenny Gam was part of. And we raise money around the world because all of OM, we're all divided into different teams. And Forest uh, Special Projects is based there at Forest Still, but I'm not always there. But we have projects in about 100 nations, often connected with communicating the gospel to Muslims uh, through audio. We especially uh, distribute through partnerships, DVDs, as you did on New Year's Eve, all over the world, but especially India, where there's been a great harvest of hundreds of thousands through that Daya Cigar film, originally only shown in film shows, but then now it can be also given away on a DVD. And I have so many different directions. Sometimes I'm moving in, and so God's message to me as I was preparing is to make sure my big priority is the Lord Jesus himself. And I've seen many churches. Can you imagine what I've seen, especially also as a church history student here in Great Britain, and living here, ministering in every part of the nation uh, for 50 years? I've seen a lot of wonderful things. I've seen God work. I've seen people saved. But I've also seen churches torn apart, relationships torn apart, marriages torn apart. And I wrestle with this a lot. It's one of the reasons I've developed my own little theory called messiology. Have you ever heard that word? Probably not. I invented it myself. <laughs> not missiology. Missiology is a legitimate word 
referring to the theology of missions, which of course we're about. Sorry I don't have my globe, but my gopher, a one-year uh, travel assistant, and I don't have one yet, by the way, for next August, uh, I couldn't resist sending him to that Urbana Student Conference. That just took place in St. Louis. 16,000 students were at Urbana. Thousands of them made commitments to global missions. So uh, he's in charge of my big blow-up globe. It blows up the world before each meeting, and uh, I don't see him until we go to Canada together. So you'll just have to be satisfied with my uh, global jacket. You've got one of these jackets, don't you? You don't? Wow. Anyway, I'll still fellowship with you. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. Again, a great chapter as we've come through this amazing summer of the Olympics and the Paralympics. And in the midst of that, God was working and people were coming to Jesus. Thousands came to London to evangelize in connection with the Olympics. They had to send out a message to pull back a little bit because people were being, you know, presented the gospel so often uh, if they were anywhere near the Olympic events. And so this is a tremendous passage as we think back of the 2012 and as we look toward 2013, Hebrews 11. I'm sorry, Hebrews 12. I wish we had time for 11 as well. Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. I want to ask you, as you go into the new year, is there something you should be throwing off? I wonder if there's anybody here that's got into the world of pornography as I did as a teenager and have had to be, a, be careful of all of my life, almost like, like I don't think I am, but uh, the, porno, the word porno, pornoholic sort of uh, frightens me a bit. Because Christ came into my life before I got any kind of addiction, I've always had a high level of victory and have been able to help many people especially with certain books that we distribute. The pornography problem for men, and I have women come to me and say, don't leave us out. Women are struggling with this as well because of curiosity and other complexities. But for men, the problem is five times more difficult than in my day. In my day, we had difficulty when we were in a terrible mood and a lustful mood, we had difficulty finding anything. Today, people just click, and it's on their telephone. And if this has been a struggle in your life, maybe you're just playing around with a little bit, I'd urge you to make 2013 a victorious year. And if necessary, take a step to get help, to get a higher level of accountability. And it was accountability that helped me, and being honest and open and taking off the mask. I'm reading a book called Two-Faced. It's a very heavy book. It's just so convicting of how easily as Christians we wear a mask. And often when we're in Christian leadership, we're wearing a mask and the, the, the person people are looking at is not the real person. And maybe in this area, you're wearing a mask. People think you're a dedicated Christian. You're a leader of a small group or you're witnessing, and praise God for those things. And we cannot wait until we're perfect before we start launching out. That's another mistake on the other end of the pendulum. That's why this word, messiology, is important to me. It's based on a George Verwer proverb. I read the proverbs almost every day, so now I've started to write my own. But uh, I don't think I'm going to get them in the Bible. I don't even know how to apply but uh, my George Verwer proverb is where two or three of the Lord's people are gathered together, sooner or later there's a mess. <laughs> I've never had anyone counter that and say that's not true. And I've taken surveys all over the world. Of course, that doesn't mean we aren't committed to excellency. We aren't committed to victory. Of course we are. When I was international leader of OM, which was 46 years, and it was a wonderful day when I could step out of that. And some of you, you may have big changes in your life coming, 
Don't be afraid of change. Don't think you have to always do the same thing in the same way, in the same position. And that's why focusing on the Lord himself is so important. And the beautiful thing that's really helped me in my faith is that God is often working in messy situations. Maybe you're involved in in checking out this fellowship, thinking of getting more involved, but maybe you've heard this or maybe you've seen something that's, that's a bit messy or doesn't seem quite right. It's so amazing how Christians can be so critical. Sometimes it's the music. Sometimes it's the way the seats are put. Sometimes it's the translation of the Bible they're using. There are so many different emphases, especially once we move into the whole area of the gifts of the Spirit, which we have in this church. I think, and I've watched this for 50 years, when we do that, things get wonderful, but they also get 10 times more complicated because different people have different ideas of how it's all going to work. And some people try to copy other people, and so they don't really have a gift of the Spirit. It's just something they've copied because they, they think that's a badge for spirituality. God is working in the world today. At this point, I often hold up my big globe, but I'll just have to turn around. The best part of the world is on the back of this. This, this global jacket isn't making the big impact the way it used to because people have seen it, even on the internet. It's my global underwear that's really cutting edge, <laughs> but not this year. Not this year. And so maybe you want to take that word. I've rewritten my, new, my old book, Out of the Comfort Zone, and taken the last chapter out because it's out of date, and I put in a new chapter. I can also send it to you on its own called Messiology because so many of the books I've been reading for many years are very critical of this, of that. Criticizing the church is especially popular. We had a gifted writer in Britain 40 years ago. His book sold well. Do you know what his ability was? Ridicule Christians. He was a Christian, and I think he meant well, but he would ridicule pretty well everything that Christians did. Guess what was the biggest thing that often got ridiculed, huh? Prayer meetings. Because prayer meetings can be a little, you know, they can be a little strange. You know, where two or three are gathered together, even in a prayer meeting, there can be a mess. You ever been in a prayer meeting where a guy played, prayed a completely stupid prayer? Huh? I've been in too many. I used to find it a struggle. Now I just say, thank you, Jesus. Messiology. This guy's a mess. His prayer's a mess. And I don't believe what he's saying. And I wish I could punch him. But God, I believe you can somehow work since God's had thousands and thousands of years working with human beings of all kinds even before you appeared. I don't think he's going to have such a problem working even with people who seem a little strange and pray strange prayers. It's so easy to, to, to mock and to make fun of certain things that Christians do. Many today make fun of their background because they came from a very legalistic church. Another so-called top theologian just came out with a brand new book. He's already mocked the church so often. I don't know why his opening chapter in the new book is ridiculing the church he went to as a child. It was strict. It was legalistic. It was in America. But you see, that was the culture of their day. That's all those people knew. That kind of more strict, legalistic church before the charismatic movement really took off. But guess what? In those days, hundreds of thousands were coming to Jesus. Yes, in those churches. How can you explain that? Even more difficult, how do you explain why hundreds, tens of thousands were coming to Christ through people who practice apartheid in South Africa? How do you explain how hundreds of thousands were coming to Jesus Christ in the southern part of the United States when they practiced integration? I mean, when they practiced segregation and go back a previous 50 years, 
when people were practicing slavery and this nation was still involved in the slave trade and yet people were being saved all over the place. Have you ever thought that through? When you think it through, you'll end up with a different view of God. You'll understand how God works in the midst of culture, even the ugly aspects of culture, which in the depth of his heart, of course, he wants to change. But somehow in his patience and his mercy, he waits for things to change. You're an amazing church. You're way ahead of your times. There's not, there's not many churches. There are a few in London because in some ways it's the only way ahead in London. But you're an interracial church. You're an international church. The first church that tried to do this in Chicago 50 years ago, it was going really well for a couple of years. They even wrote a book about it. It's always something when you write a book about it. The devil's the first one to read the book. And he says, oh, they, they're patting themselves on the back. That church came unglued, the black and white people, broken relationships, and they discovered it's one thing to talk. It's another thing to walk, to walk the interracial road, to walk the international road where you truly, honestly esteem people who are very different from you. I find enough Anglo-Saxons. That's supposedly what I am. Ah, grandfather from the Netherlands. Other grandfather was Irish, Scottish, and English. <laughs> Basically toxic Anglo-Saxon. I find I have enough trouble with other Anglo-Saxons, much less attempting to leap and start getting involved with pygmies in the Congo and Eskimos in northern Canada. I mention that group specifically because it's one of the few groups that has not yet had intermarriage, even on Operation Mobilization. And we led the world with over 1,000 international, interracial marriages around the world, and now they're producing kids as if they were going to go out of season. So I thank the Lord for John Piper's new book, Bloodlines, brand new book, probably the best book on racism. In some ways, it's 50 years too late in the United States. But God loves people. His son, the Lord Jesus Christ, died on the cross that we may no longer stand with all of our sin poking everybody in the face, but we stand forgiven. The only way to understand God's work through all kinds of churches, all kinds of situations, all kinds of people is the blood of Jesus Christ and the fact that we are his children and he has phenomenal patience with his children. And you know, when this really gets into your spiritual DNA, you will become more big hearted. You will become more forgiving. Things that really upset you won't bother you much, so much anymore. You may not want to get involved. And I have developed my own theology of limitation. I know my limits. But because I may not want to get involved in a particular church or with a particular person or with a particular group because of some doctrinal peculiarities or other factors, because I don't want to get involved, I can never say, God, you can't get involved. And so God is involved. A lot of people are now criticizing the churches in Nigeria. Boy, the Nigerians are getting a lot of negative flack. They're all into prosperity. A couple of Nigerian pastors have their own private jets. I just read an article about the private jets in Nigeria. One pastor of a big church is against the private jets. Another pastor is pro-private jets. So now we got private jet theology. But let me tell you one thing about Nigeria. God is moving in that nation. And God is moving among Nigerians here in London. Not in the midst of a perfect ideal situation with people of perfect integrity, perfect honesty, that have all the theology totally sorted out and never do anything wrong, never say anything wrong, never dance the wrong step. No, in the midst of the mess, the Nigerian mess, God is working. In the midst of the American mess, and that's the biggest mess of all, God is working. China is now competing to create a bigger mess, but God is working in China because... This treasure is in earthen vessels. We all have clay feet. And one of the mistakes some people, young people make and end up even leaving the church altogether is what I call totally unrealistic expectation about human behavior. 
Beware of it, especially when you're in those idealistic young years reading all kinds of idealistic material that will give you a complete false view of what life is about. Yes, look to Hebrews 11. We're running a race. We need to lay aside every weight, anything that hinders as we go along, but we need to get to the key passage as we read about the Lord Jesus himself. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us with our eyes on Jesus. I've said a lot of things, some of them perhaps I shouldn't have said, but this is the main thing, to run the race with our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, I have to be honest. I am constantly, maybe it's my age, constantly tempted to grow weary. Constantly tempted to lose heart. One of the priority nations in my life is Afghanistan. I've given 53 years of prayer to Afghanistan. I've sent people to Afghanistan. I've seen them murdered there. The man who helped and became my pioneer for that country is buried in Kabul. And as I look at Afghanistan, the Russians came, and it was horrendous. And then after that, the Taliban came. It was more horrendous. And then we had this civil war. We cannot even measure the suffering that's gone on and continues in Afghanistan today. So what about my 52 years of praying? What about my whole life ministry, speaking about this nation all over the world? I will tell you, humanly speaking, I'm shattered. I'm disappointed. My prayers have not been answers. I know it's not good to say something like that, but that's just the truth. And even as I read about Syria, what's, what's going on in Syria right now is so horrendous. There's a lot of horrendous things going on in the world right now. Nothing is equal to Syria. And the greatest governments in the world and the UN have been able to do nothing about that impossible catch-22 situation. It knocks me out, but I'll tell you one thing you need to know. Whenever some information or sadness knocks me out, Jesus picks me up. Maybe something's knocked you out this year. Maybe a disappointment. Maybe a loved one. I just had an email uh, from a close friend, and his, one of his closest friends just committed suicide. I wonder if any of you have had a friend commit suicide. You probably will sooner or later, as suicide is on the, cre on the increase. That's why I try to talk to people about radical grace and how God can forgive and God can restore no matter how evil, no matter how bad that situation, the message of radical discipleship, which we so strongly believe, needs constantly brought into balance with the message of radical grace. I've been working on that balance all of my life. If something has knocked you out, maybe a family affair, maybe you've lost your job, maybe some suffering that you just read about, if something has knocked you out, I'll just tell you, the only way, let Jesus pick you up. When I walked out of Madison Square Garden, a baby Christian, 20 minutes in Jesus, I had this very attractive girl with me. And as we walked out in the streets of New York, uh, some guys, sort of street characters, said some nasty things about her. This was my first opportunity to stand for Jesus in righteousness. And I looked these guys in the eye. I said, you can't say that. That's not right. Whack! The next thing I knew, I was laying on the streets of New York City. 20 minutes after my conversion, I'm already knocked down. This is my 57-year testimony. That's why I like Rocky 1, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4. Because he just keeps getting knocked out. And in the end, he wins. And I've been knocked down so many times. Sometimes by lust. Sometimes by my bad temper. Sometimes by wrong attitudes. Sometimes by discouragement and unbelief. But every time, Jesus has picked me up. 
Jesus has picked me up because his grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. And so I want to encourage you, make this a special year. Lay aside anything that's hindering you in this race and put your focus on the Lord himself. So easy to become self-centered. As believers, we can be self-centered. It's complicated because we need to care for ourselves. We have to counsel people sometimes, have a very poor view of themselves. Some of you, your bottom line problem may be that you don't have a poor, a, a proper view of yourself. I'll close with this story from Tony Campolo, and it's helped a lot of people. I think I've told it here before, but many of you are new. There was a, a group of people in a thunderstorm. The lightning was fierce. The, the thunder was so loud, even the adults were, were very nervous. And then they realized their little daughter was up uh, alone in the bedroom. They ran upstairs and they opened the door, and there the little girl is looking out the window. There's another flash of lightning. They said, are you okay? And she said, I'm fine. I think God is taking my picture. Whoa, I never thought of that. Have you taken that into the depth of your DNA? He loves you, even when you've failed, even when you can hardly love yourself. I've had times when I absolutely despised myself, especially when I failed in the lust of the eyes in the area of pornography, once in the woods right here in London. But somehow I knew the Word of God, and I hope you'll get into those sessions on understanding the Word of God. Before I was 18, I was saturated with the Word of God, including hundreds of verses, and left the top university studies to enroll in a Bible college which completely transformed my life. Brothers and sisters, 2013 can be the greatest year in your life. It's up to you by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, help us to take steps of faith. Help us not to be hearers of the word, but to be doers. Help us to grow in grace and wisdom and discernment, to understand how to maintain that biblical balance, to understand the balance between excellency and messiology, to really have a deep acceptance of ourself and your love for us at the same time, to deal with the self-life and to run the race with our eyes fixed upon you. Help us now to take steps of faith, for we ask in Jesus' name. Let's continue in prayer. I'm going to give a very short invitation, but if you're willing to trust God that 2013 is going to be a great year in your life, you're going to be a marathon runner, you're going to lay aside any weight, any hindrance, this is going to be a marathon year, an Olympic year, because of the grace the radical grace in Jesus Christ. Because if he can use such a needy, struggling character almost every day for 57 years like this guy who's been talking to you, then he can use you more than you've ever dreamed. And so if you want to trust him and believe him for greater things in 2013, I want you just to stand up where you are and I want to pray a prayer of commitment. I'm not going to call you forward. You can come forward if you want special prayer, but I'm going to ask you just to stand up where you are. God bless you. Many are praying for this meeting. I have 100,000 who follow me in prayer. Some of them are praying now. God bless you. God fill you with His Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for each person standing before you right now. I know it's a majority of people because your Holy Spirit has prepared these people in many, many different ways for this moment of commitment. And Lord, I also stand before you. I want 2013 to be a better year. I especially want to be a more godly father, a more godly patient grandfather. I want to be a more godly husband for my dear wife who at times has suffered through my own stupidity. And so, Lord, I recommit myself to you to run this race, laying aside every weight. Lord, I don't trust myself in this pornography thing. And I just lay this again into your hands that you'd help me maintain integrity and reality in the battle against the lust of the eyes. Father, you know everything about us, everything about us, and you love us still. 
And it's that love and that grace, all paid for on the cross, that will enable us to run this race, even if this is our final year. Will you give you the glory in Jesus' name? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, let's end uh, our time this morning in the service. Let's join hands together and say the grace together. Let's look at uh, into one another's eyes because we do need the grace of God to see us through and we're doing it as a family here as God has put us here in this local church. Okay, let's join hands. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great week and a great year ahead of you.